When it comes to the African Muslims who hate Indians, African Muslims hate Muslim Indians because they oppress them. That's a very strong statement yes. you're making on I, I don't know how to put it stronger. They hate them like no other community hates anyone else. You, I'm talking about experience now. So how do you identify? As a Muslim. But you just made a statement about Indians. Yes, so I'm very because blacks. I because so, I'm, so, so, so yeah, I'm so really an Indian. Okay, ethnically. I'm more Indian than Maulana Bam, for example. <laughs> I'm the only Sunni in the world that shook both hands of the Supreme Leader of Iran. I made a mistake by taking his right hand, which was blown off in a bomb incident. So he shook my hand, but then he gave me his left hand to give me a nice embrace. In Conversation With is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry, Crown Mines, and shot on location at Kurtuba Convention Center. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome to another edition of In Conversation. Today I'm honored to have Buta Khanif Hendricks, an old family friend, uh, a veteran Islamic worker in Cape Town, a veteran lawyer in labor issues and labor advisory, and the president and founder and funder of Al Jama. Jazakal Khair for joining us. Uh, no, it's a pleasure and it's nice to be on your show. Shukran, shukran so much. You know, when, when you walked in, we had a conversation and I asked you what year you were born. You said you were born in 1949. So you the first generation of post-World War II people in South Africa. Yeah, that is correct. What, what, what type of world was the world post-World War II? If you look at South African history, we have a very interesting history. I mean, we were in World War I, we were in World War II, we were in some other... I mean, and, 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 and what was South Africa like in the 50s, post-World War II? You know, we, we always watch these movies of what the West was like post-World War II, different types of genres. But what was South Africa like post-World War II, someone who was born in 1949? What was the world well, like for you? Uh, and uh, give, give, given where we are today, you know, what yeah, was the world nine like? Nine months before I was born, there was a wedding in the city six. And for that year, there was no rice. So at this wedding, because my grandfather was a, an, a bookkeeper for 20 traders, this was the first wedding that year that served rice at the wedding. Wow. So that was a signature event. It was a talk of the town. Nowadays, people talk about biryani and anash with <laughs> acne and, you know, how was the kalia and the soji. And uh, that time it was dry rice. And, and, and what was the mood of people as you grew up? Was South Africa impacted in, in the 50s? What, yes, what, what, what was uh, people's look, mood economically? Uh, my grand, uh, grandparents, uh, Ahmad and Rabia Bully, they used to accommodate, visit sporting teams from Durban, table tennis, cricket, and there was no hotel accommodation for them. And they were accommodated and uh, at 72 Chapel Street, the same street where Mjostro Street Moss is in. And my mother, obviously a young girl then, had to help her mother uh, cook and uh, so, because I was the first grandchild of the Bully family, Sheikh Hanif Bully, Sheikh Yusuf Bully, Bully the Hafiz person. Oh, those, those are your uncles? That's my mother's brothers. Oh, okay. So, uh, that is the environment uh, we grew in. And because I was the eldest, I had to live with the grandparents. So, from there, I went to Chapel Street School. Uh, because, you know, the grandparents wanted the grandson to live with them. So I grew up in a very protected environment. There were people all the time. There were sporting activists in table tennis, in cricket, uh, not rugby at that time. And uh, that uh, obviously introduced me to many South Africans from outside the Cape. So my father was an Indian. When he came to, he, when, uh, he came to Cape Town and fell in love with my mother, he could only stay three weeks. I had to go back to Durban. 
So, uh, uh, when my mother got married, she was very worried that her husband will be deported back to Durban and he'll most probably take me with because the father takes the, the boy. So when, any, when anyone knocked on the door and she had a, a uh, say, a dozen plates in her hand, she will drop the plates on the floor, thinking that it was a guy called Scruder that will come and arrest my father because working for the Department of Information. So my grandmother, you know, saw her daughter under distress. So she had a friend called Auntie Rahmi who lost a son. And she told him, you lost a son, why didn't you adopt my future son-in-law? And that's why I have the surname Hendrix. My surname is Latif. Okay. My father's name was Imam Sheikh Latif. His father was secretary of the Natal Indian Congress. Wow. His father was one of the first funders of the Grey Street Moss. But my, mother, my grandmother, who I live with in Chapel Street, her father was Haji Uzi Ali. If you go to Canal Walk, uh, section 4, you'll see his statue there. And the Oliver Tambo Foundation built his statue because he gave the African National Congress its name, introduced them to Congress politics, and wrote some clauses of the constitution. So that's the family I grew in. My grandmother, uh, Arabia uh, Ali, and she married a bully. Uh, she was an activist. Her father was, uh, you know, uh, uh, activist in Kimberley, where they formed the uh, non-European uh, movement. Uh, formed by 200 blacks and 200 colored Indians and whites. They elected him as a chairman. So you come, you come from a rich political history. So both sides of the, my father's side was Natal. My mother's side was Transvaal. So Congress politics is in our blood. So I, 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 I didn't actually support the partition of Pakistan from India. Okay. I felt, you know, India must be one country of Muslims and Hindus. Uh, however, there was good reason, which you understand today, why there was a partition. So I read up on Nehru from the Indian side. And then from the uh, 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 Muslim side, I read up on the, the Muslim, Jinnah. on Jinaya. And uh, so even as a primary school student, I used to... My father used to give me the books because he was born on Pakistan's uh, Independence Day. And he told me that I want you to become the president of Pakistan. So I was a great follower of Imran Khan, the cricketer. Okay. <laughs> because my father said, I must be president. Yeah, I see he is now beating me to it. And I'm trying to get a council seat in the city of Cape Town. You started quite late in formal politics. Yeah, look, uh, I, you know, I, mean, you started I in, got an in, award in, in 2011, 20, 2012? Uh, 2007. 2007 when you first started. Wow. So I'll give you the background that before that, in 2002, I got an award as a pioneer of the internet for creating next generation jobs, new revenue streams. So that's why when the ANC and DA talk, I talk about jobs, they don't know what they're talking about. I, I mean, we're jumping from place to place, but I do want to touch on your manifesto. Because yes. in your manifesto, there's a lot of issues relating to technology and developing and creating job creation and the role of technology in developing the country. But, but we'll, get, we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. We'll okay. get there. But I, yeah. think, I think that's actually something very unique because you have it quite detailed, the role of technology in taking the country to, to the next economic level. So let, but, me, let me go back to the... <laughs> To the, uh, to the roots of where I am today. So my surname is Hendricks. So now in Durban, uh, because my surname is Hendricks, they think I'm a Malay. When it comes to the African Muslims who hate Indians, African Muslims hate Muslim Indians because they oppress them. That's a very strong statement yes. you're making on- I, I don't know how to put it stronger. They hate them like no other 
community hates anyone else. You, uh, I'm talking about an experience now. You realize that you are that a very senior member in the Muslim community. I know. And, and I've that, told... That's this, a very loaded statement. I've told Indian leaders, this is a problem. What we do about it? I told them now, how much... Do you mean Indian Muslim, 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 Indian Hindu, Indian across what you... No, I'm not talking about Hindus. Okay. But I can only speak about Muslims. I don't have any mandate to speak on behalf of Hindus. So... My major challenge has been over the last 30 years in the MSA. I was the founder of the MSA. And I saw this problem emerging, discussed at MSA meetings. And then uh, when I got into politics and started trying to get African Muslims uh, to join our party, like the Imams, the Maulanas from the Ilums, they didn't want to join the party because, and then I told them, you know, but then they asked me, your surname is Hendrix. We can talk to you. Not knowing I'm, a, I'm more Indian than all the other Indians. <laughs> so my mother from my um, grandmother's side, they were activists, well respected by African chiefs. And then also, from the bully side, my big mama was a, a slave from Java. Uh, mama Kapi. So this is your third grandmother? Fourth possibly. Fourth, fourth possibly. So her son was Karel the Pilgrim. The first person in South Africa to perform the pilgrimage while she was a slave. He later became an imam of one of the Bukha mosques. So that is my background, my lineage. I don't know whether I'm an Indian or a Malay. Right? So I can proudly say I'm a Muslim. So how do you identify? As a Muslim. But you just made a statement about Indians Yes, yeah, so I'm very, because blacks. I, because so, I'm, so, so, so you, so I'm really an Indian. Okay, ethnically. I'm more Indian than Maulana Bam, for example. <laughs> Okay. Maulana Bam runs the mosque that my grandfather started in Joburg. New, the Newton, Newton Masjid? Yes. Okay. It was called the Hamidiyah Mosque that time. Yes, Hamidiyah, yes. 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 My grandfather uh, built and find, founded and funded that mosque. So, so, so you're clearly someone who has credentials. You're not a no-name brand. Because to be honest with you, may, 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 I mean, uh, many people like ask, you know, who is, who is Hanif Hendricks? Where does he come from? Like he's, you are, suddenly we just saw you in politics. And I think that's, that's what I was alluding to the comment I made is that you started late in formal politics, at least at the national level. When, of course, when, when I was in the you. corporate world earning big bucks. That's my shares. And when I, after 2002, after five years, I was well off. You know, we used to work 18 hours a day in the corporate How, world. Before we get there, let, let's, 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 Take you into the MSA, so yes. it clear, it's clear from your from 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 your, your the activism family you come from, uh, and your as you said you were in the you founded the MSA, that it's clear you had a certain way of thinking, uh, and a certain worldview which was, in very broad terms, liberation, uh, Islamic liberation thought, Islam, Ikhwanism. Were you involved in any way in 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 Ikhwani thinking? Ikh yeah, look. I mean, uh, I, I mean I, I also a question we, off camera. You told me that your relationship to Imam Harun, your uh, relationship with, with Imam Ahmed Qasim. Uh, a, you, you can answer this directly. You can answer it in the conversation. Is was 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 there any formal Ikhwani Muslim uh, Muslim Brotherhood structures in South Africa, or was it part of of, of the broader thinking and broader thoughts? Look, there were, was a structure in Utrecht for Art Hendricks of the MIM. Okay. Uh, they had a formal structure, but Imam Harun had all the books of the Ikhwan al One of the books I remember is What We Stand For. There was another book uh, which traced the, uh, the history of the Ikhwan al in Egypt. And in that book, for example, it said how you start a party that can run Egypt. And they said it will take 74 years. 
I did a calculation. Exactly after 74 years, they ruled Egypt. But what the book didn't say, they only ruled for one year. But they ruled Egypt in terms of that book. So Imam Harun uh, used to have senior students, Fakir, Nordin, uh, quite a few of them. And I was attending their madrasa classes in the six. So you were one. So you were one level under Imam Harun's students. So it's Imam Harun, correct, yeah. his students. I never, then... I never met Imam Harun. Okay, okay. But he was my principal. He was your principal at your school. Okay. Because he was, it was his senior students who were madrasa teachers. Okay. So Imam Harun used to be the lecture you used to be that was that was standard reading of all his students and because i was a, a madrasa student in high school i could share the books with one of his senior students uh, imam nordin, umar nordin my who was also a close friend of my mother okay so he used to visit regularly that's that's my my uncle my, my, my uncle? father's brother <laughs> well a great person and uh, when we started the MSA, he went to Imam Harun because years before that, I was identified as the person by Imam Harun to start the MSA. Imam Harun felt that there needs to be a Muslim student association at every campus. There were UCT Islamic Society, UWC Islamic Society. What year was this more or less? This was 1960, 1907, just before he died. In September, we launched the Cape Muslim Students Association. <coughs> we had a thousand students at the Lebanon Institute in District 6, mostly high school students. So for that conference, uh, my first speech was written by your uncle, I believe. <laughs> he wrote down the dua in English, so I don't make, my, my, I don't make mistakes and I say the Okay, all right. So he wrote it very carefully. I just had to ayah. Okay. And then the Kharafs and the Tajweed would be perfect. <laughs> so he went to that finer detail so that I could make an impression. And I was elected as the PRO, but because, uh, you know, most of the students elected that year graduated. From which school was this? Uh, no, I was at UWC. UW, oh, at the university. I was a first year student. Okay. So when I came to UWC, there was for art, there was Sheikh Faik Khamildin from Cape Town. Yes. And Mamuna Jardin from PE. And when I landed on campus, a first year student, they gave me the keys to the Jamaat Khana. They said, you in charge. I said, I'm a first year student. They are second, third year, but they said, look, we know your mother. We know where you lived. We want you to take the lead. So you've even been an imam sub also. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I when, the, when Sheikh Dean didn't pitch or Sheikh Najah didn't pitch or Sheikh Umar Kabir didn't pitch to do the Juma. I then had a khutaba written by your uncle that I could read, uh, you know, written in English. But uh, when I read, it's Arabic. Okay. In such a way, I don't make touch weed mistakes. <laughs> he was perfect at that. Mashallah. Abdul Khanif, I want to pause on something here. If you are telling me in the late 60s, uh, you were part of creating Muslim Students Associations and developing that Let's type of... 1970. 1970. But in that era, that is quite revolutionary in terms of the global Islamic movement. I mean, if you look at what was happening in other... In other, in other parts of the Muslim world, where there were Muslim diaspora. Yes. I, I mean, I don't think there was that type of activity that was happening. Other than, of course, other chapters of Ikhwani thinking, such as the Triple IT, Ismail Raji Farooq and these guys, etc. In Malaysia, I mean, that was still starting in Malaysia. But in, in, in the, in, right, right at the bottom of Africa, you know, somewhere in Cape Town, there are men and women who, who, who have this thinking who are developing these structures. This even predates the Khomeini Revolution. People talk about the Khomeini Revolution, but in 1970, the Khomeini Revolution wasn't even, it wasn't yeah, even, in, correct, yeah. it, it wasn't even a thought. I mean, they were just getting, they were just sorting out the Mossadegh issue and, and all of that, and the Shah was back in power. The Khomeini Revolution wasn't even on the, on, on the agenda at that time. Even in the Mideast, that was before the October War. So I find that 
very, very interesting that there was this thinking and this vision. Uh, and this happening in this little corner there at the bottom of Africa, compared to what was happening in the rest of the Muslim world. Look, I told you my mom had a safe house. I used to take the people to visit their husbands on Robben Island, four o'clock in the morning, bring mm. them back as 11, 12 year old. So when I came to University of Western Cape, uh, Sheikh Faik Kamil then, there was a guy, Suleiman Bayat, the Maulana, they were running the Islamic society. They just gave me the keys. But later in the year, I became chairman of the Free Mandela Committee. I became editor of the campus newspaper, Unibel. And Jake Scherwell was my secretary. I used to boss him around. He was a junior lecturer. Is your Jake Scherwell was your, was your junior? Sorry? Jake Scherwell was your junior? No, but he was my senior. He was a junior lecturer. Junior lecturer, okay. But the SRC asked him to be my editor or something because he was good at Afrikaans. Okay. So I was in good at Afrikaans. So then Unibel newspaper, the first, the University of Western Cape's first campus newspaper, uh, you know, I needed an African solid person because, you know, you got to write proper Afrikaans at UWC uh, to create an impression. And um, I was also with Adam Small in my second year with Fees Must Fall. I was the right hand man. So Fees Must Fall started yeah. with Adam Small in 1972, three. I may have, I may be out a year or two. Then I went to Libya in 74. I spent a couple of weeks in Libya and my suddenly some people from the PLO came to wish me from the hotel. In 74 was, I think Gaddafi just came in at around that time. He was there for two, three years. Because he, he came also in the early, I don't know exactly, but he yes, was also... In 71, I think, was so which was just, just, He was just in at that time. So he started the, uh, the organization for the United States of Africa. And I was a founder member with him. And uh, the problem he had was that he wanted to introduce what they called the third international theory, a combination of socialism and capitalism and Islam. So the Muslim delegates there didn't like it. They said, it's Islam or nothing. So he walked out of the conference. But we still carried on and there was a guy called Awadi that, uh, you know, stood in for him. You can't expect a president to be at a conference for two weeks. You know, he just pops in ceremonially and so on. And uh, so while I was there, we negotiated the weapons for the liberation movement. Which part of the liberation movement? Uh, the PLO wanted to support the ANC. The ANC specifically. But at the same time, Gaddafi said no, all liberation movements, not only the PAC. It's not only the ANC, so that means the PAC, Azapu, Kibla. I don't know if Kibla was around, but they had elements of a Kibla uh, around. So uh, they asked several people, who do we give the weapons to? Which liberation movements? Not only myself alone. They told me, look, you are one of many people. We just wanted to have an idea of which liberation movements we must give the weapons to. So then they mentioned Matanjima, I said, no. Because remember, I'm now very active in black consciousness and Steve Biko, and I even met Steve Biko. He told us from today, colored and Indians are black. I'm even BG, I am the current black consciousness movement chess champion. Because after that, they were banned and there was never a chess championship <laughs> again. So uh, no one has taken the title away from me yet. I'm South Africa's black chess champion well, at Zululand University, <laughs> where I had to eat peanut butter the whole week because there was no halal food. <laughs> so you, 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 have, you have many experiences in life. Yes, uh, very exciting experiences, thrown into the deep end. And uh, uh, I uh, was later on chairman of the alumni at UWC. I was chairman of the convocation. Where, where I'm trying to understand what is what is your forte in skills? Are you a very good administrator? Are you a very good leader? Are you a disciplinarian? Are you what 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 is it that that they, what is it that that your peers 
or your seniors, your contemporaries, your followers? What is it that they see in you in terms of leadership? What do you think is your, is, is what your, your, I'm sure, I'm sure you self-reflect and contemplate very often. Yeah, look, it's very difficult for you for me to say this, but I lived in Rochester Road in, the, in uh, very close to the right docks. My father had a business there mm. and I used to run the shop from five o'clock till we closed every day after school. I don't know if that child labor or what, but that's <laughs> how it works, you know, probably behind the counter. They used to call me Paisasian. Okay, Paisasian. Up to today when they see me, they don't call me Honorable Hendricks, Paisasian. Okay. Right? That's where we get our votes from, from those people. They know me, oh, I buy this and always vote for. So, um, uh, 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 the question you asked, you know, I'm 74, so okay. I forget very quickly. Okay. What, are, what, what, what is your forte in terms yes, of skills? So I, lived in in the, I lived in Rochester Road, and we had some icons living in the street. It was the Jakut brothers, Dr. Fuad Jakut, Dr. Mahani Jakut, he's still alive. And they used to call me Imam. I was even half as they call me Imam. And I used to be the leader in the street. When the two brothers used to fight when we had a cricket match, then I was the one to stop them and they would listen to me. So is, is there a very serious side to you? Yes. I, I, I won't use the word aggressive, but a very strong, that, that is strict correct. side. That is correct, yeah. So uh, I think that uh, I, uh, I, uh, I am a stayer. I complete a project. Okay. So when it came to the formation of the Cape Muslim Student Association and everyone left in the next year, I took charge, made sure that we now go to conference and have a national MSA. And then I became president of the MSA. I, when it came to Radio 76, I was chairman of the radio station. It took me six years to get a permanent license. I stayed the course. When it came to the Matli Shura al-Islami, and there was a, a, a fallout with the MGC, I kept the organization together. We formed the Yusuluddin College. We graduated so, so, some of so, the Imams. So is it that you, are you capable of seeing a long-term goal and working towards realizing it? That, 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 that takes that, a, I mean, people, people charge hundreds of thousands for conferences and lectures and training to, to help you realize that and to even explain what that means. And well, it seems that that's, that's that, what you got. That was natural for me, you know, when I became a first year student and the rest of my life. And uh, with politics, in 2007, uh, there was a Najah guy that was killed at the waterfront. And at his funeral, Sheikh Gabriel said, we must need a Muslim party. So everyone comes to me and says, Khadif, you must start a Muslim party. I said, but Imtiaz Suleiman, he had a party. Bring him back. No, 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 he's uh, interested in other things. We want you to start a Muslim political party from scratch. And eventually I was persuaded to do it. Why did you not pursue politics before that? Because because what you are saying is you come from an activist background. Uh, your family was activist. You were in Muslim student associations. You were in the uh, Islamic Unity Convention. All of that is, is, is it's, it's, it's very deep politics and, uh, and a lot of these, as you, I mean, you were, in your own words, you were, you were even involved in, in, in organizing a cachet of arms to the liberation movement, the, the, the natural progression of things would be, okay, let, them, let, me, let, me, let me continue in politics. Where were you in 1994? Look, uh, remember I was in a corporate world, earning a fat salary, double what I earn now. What shares as growing, you know, astronomically. So I had a comfortable life, but besides working in a corporate world, I spent more time on community activities, mostly with the Shura mostly with the Matli Shura and also with Radio 76. So this is in the late, this is in the 90s? Yes. The and then also, you know, if you run a radio station, you can't get involved in politics. 
and I knew that we needed a permanent license uh, for the Muslim community. Our competitors were Voice of the Cape, but they were right wing and we were left wing. And we felt the community needed a left wing radio station. A liberatory kind of radio station. You're one of the first Muslim leaders I've sp I speak to who actually recognizes and articulates, who's even mentioning the word left wing and right wing. Yes. W what does that look like in Islamic in, in, in Islam in South Africa? What does right wing and left right wing, wing and would, left wing I would mean? say is the conservatives. What does conservative mean? Conservatives would be like the uh, the Butlish in Pretoria. They are the right at the extreme you mean, end. You mean in Port Elizabeth? Port Elizabeth. Yeah. Right at the extreme end. So that uh, Mufti Desai has sent me to Jahannam several times because I'm a politician. But I have breakfast with him. Okay. But, 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 but you do realize that what you are doing now is, uh, is when, especially with the right wing, when people talk about the right wing, even right wing in America, for example, or right wing in Britain. No, it's different to that. No, no, right no, 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 we always find the most extreme minority, ex, uh, violent or, 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 or irrational expression of, of, of the right wing. And we, like say, the and we say this is the right wing. Yeah. But that right wing is not representative of, of what the right wing is. I know, I right? know. This is a Muslim right wing. But, but but even within the Muslim right wing, yeah. Majlis is a, is is it's 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 on the it's on the, it's 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 on the extreme. What, yes. what 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 is what do you consider to be the general Muslim right wing in South Africa? Well, the the you the, mentioned the MJC. That's very in yeah. interesting. Look, uh, uh, the MJC um, must remember that the MJC formed the Shura. Okay. It was a Muslim parliament formed by them. And they captured me because I was, I could, I was an English student. This is of Sheikh Abu Bakr Najjar or? This was Sheikh Umar Khabir. Umar Khabir, okay, that was? Sheikh Nazim. Okay, Sheikh Nazim, okay. And Sheikh Ahmad Bihadin. Okay. And uh, they um, uh, formed the Shura. And they wanted some university students to help with secretarial work. So you consider that thinking conservative? Was that, or those are conservatives? Uh, look, uh, I think that uh, I felt they were very progressive. Uh. Uh, whereas the activists in the Muslims, uh. like the Nordins, uh, they felt that the MJC is reactionary. My uncle Thabit Bully. They felt they need to wake up the MGC. And there were people like uh, Ibrahim Rasul, Call of Islam, and, and, and people like that? No, they are fringe Muslim organizations. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's <laughs> fringe Muslim organizations. Are you using your seniority in age to make these, yes. to make these big statements? Yes. Sometimes, you know, when are you're you like that, that, they forgive you easily. <laughs> so they won't forgive me for saying that. But uh, Call of Islam, uh, they weren't really into the heart of the work that the MJC did, that Shura did, that Muslim organizations. Uh, I don't. I don't think they claim that. But would, but would they not be considered the 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 left? No, uh, they were uh, considered uh, to be uh, not to the left, but they were considered to be with the uh, liberals, like Nusas. Okay. They never ever had the, they never had my respect. Never had my, I was never impressed with Call of Islam. Well, maybe they didn't invite me to their meetings, they didn't see me as part of them. But for me, they were a maverick organization. So who is considered then a moderate left? If Call of Islam were, were, were fringe, then who? Look, then you had the, you had the MIM. Okay. You had the MSA. You had the Tabligh movement. Do you consider? You had Kibla. Do you consider those to be left? Moderately. The, the left? only one that left was Kibla. Kibla. No one else. Left in what? Left in values, morals. Left in. Uh, left, left in. in left in critical thinking and revolutionary thinking. 
Is that what we refer to in leftist? Yeah, they were left in. Uh, yeah, they were inspired by the by Khomeini. Okay. But and, but but Khomeini. And remember, everyone but Khomeini else. Came in very, and this is the point. Khomeini, Khomeini was the only one inspired by Khomeini. Everyone else uh, was was not because of the Shia Sunni conflict. Okay. So the MGC was not inspired by Khomeini. Call of Islam was not inspired by Khomeini. They need to tell me when they stood up and said we support Khomeini in those days. Maybe now they'll say it. They didn't join the marches of Qibla on the last Friday of Ramadan. So, 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 so were you inspired by Khomeini? Yes, of course. The, the reason I was inspired because he kicked America out. And so, I, was, I was nurtured and developed to understand that America is the world's first terrorist organization. I, I, want, I want to close on, on, on a thought because we're getting somewhere interesting now. In the 70s, in the 70s, Khomeini came on the scene, in the, became popular in, 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 the, in the mid to late 70s, uh, right? Uh, I think internationally. Yes. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, they had the history and, and they were already, you know, well in the machine. Yes. In, 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 in by the 56, Jamal Abdel Nasser and Anwar Sadat, etc. But in, at that point in history, Muslim Brotherhood was considered conservative and Muslim Brotherhood being a revolutionary Sunni organization. Yes. Were not seeing eye to eye with the Khomeini revolution at that time. They, they, they were too different. I mean, it is now, maybe since the Mursi post-Arab Spring, yeah. that, and maybe even with Hamas at that point where, where, we, where we saw, uh, or rather the, the, the Hamas's proximity to, to, to Iran was probably the first, we could say that was maybe the tail leading the dog. It's when Hamas, as, as part of the movement, started getting closer to, to Iran and then uh, uh, Mursi and them. In, in that, Although the they were stone Sunnish. So what I'm saying is that in South Africa, for people like yourself who, who originated in a Muslim Brotherhood yes. thinking, and then uh, and then cozying, and as you very clearly saying, uh, being influenced, uh, uh, you didn't say ad ad adopting, but I mean, you're smiling when I'm talking about Khomeini. Yeah? No, let that, me that, tell that, you that, why. That, 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 you that know, was, I, I that, was, was very, that, that was very very novel. That was not heard of. That was probably very unique. And, 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 and remember, and, 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 and I was understood. chairman of the Free Mandela Committee. Yeah. I went to jail for it. Okay. Right? And I was with the activists. And they asked me, who's Khomeini? I suddenly had to go learn about Khomeini. And uh, they were very impressed with Khomeini. And because they admired Khomeini because he was a Muslim and he was a revolutionary, I started respecting Khomeini. I, I didn't know, I didn't have a clue about Shiism and Sunnism at that time. It wasn't in my life in my kapak. My, my, you know, our Madrasa teachers never spoke about Shiism or Sunnism and, you know, stay away from the Shias. That was not in our, uh, it, it, it wasn't around that time. But when Khomeini came, I, I knew, I didn't know he was a Shia, for example. Is that possible that people didn't know Khomeini? I, I knew that he was a revolutionary that kicked out America and that impressed me. So everyone in that I worked with, non-Muslims, in the struggle, asked me now, tell us about Khomeini. They would say, comrade, tell us about Khomeini because I'm a Muslim, Khomeini is a Muslim. I had to go learn up about Khomeini so that I could, you know, uh, 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 assist them. I would tell them, look, I must find out. But then I told them, join us on the march, the last day of Ramadan. Al-Quds Al Day. Yes. And they used to join us. This was the early 80s, because I think Al-Quds yeah, Day. Yeah. He announced Al-Quds Day in the early 80s. That's correct, he, where Ahmad Kashim played an important role. And uh, obviously, because of the Shia connection, uh, no one supported those marches. You, you, if you talk about calling, I think I saw Rashid Umar there uh, a few times, but never Ibrahim Rasul on a march. <laughs> on that point, let us break. We are in conversation with Hanif Hendricks, president, founder, and funder of Al Jamaa, and he will be back after this. In conversation with is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry Crown Mines. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back in conversation with Uncle Hanif Hendricks. 
جزاك الله خير. I want to continue on this on the, on, the, on what you our discussion on Khomeini and Shiaism, uh, Qibla and this. There's a word that goes around. I, I, di- I didn't know that you are one of them, but now I know you're one of them. Who, who we call Shia sympathizers. <laughs> well, look, no, I, 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 I people, people who are in Qibla I, and people come out. We're calling them Shia sympathizers. I be- appeared before the Muftish of the Majlis. Uh-huh. I went to see uh, Desai several times mm. in Port Elizabeth. Mm. I went to his place in the deer. You need a visa to get in there. I don't need a visa. <laughs> and they see me as a stone Sunni. A stone Sunni. Because the Shura are the stone Sunnis in the country under the leaders of Yasaki Hamildi. I was with them for 20, for 40 years. I'm a trustee of the Shura. So, so are you saying people who were in Qibla? I know we're talking old history, but it's, I mean, people of, of your generation and your experience can shed light on some of these historical issues that young people like me hear about, you know, and so we always have questions. So are you saying that the people who were in Qibla, they weren't Shia? I asked Ahmad Kashim, are you a Shia? Oh, really? I'm his vice chairman, right? Okay. This, this is what you're about to say is history. And we are very close. Okay, Allah Every Allah. day we're busy. I run IUC, I run the radio station for Kasim. We admire Kasim because of his revolutionary spirit. So we in a close meeting with two or three people, I ask him, look, let me clear the air. Are you a Shia? He says, I don't even know how to do abdash in terms of the Shia madhab. My father taught me the Safi madhab. And his father, Buta Kasim, was my Madrasa teacher as well. So you're saying, Ahmad Kasim, you're saying Ahmad Kasim wasn't a Shia? Never. He doesn't even know how to perform abdash in terms of the Shia madhab. He doesn't know how to perform these Salah rituals. He's never Salah on a stone. For, for him, you know, and, I'm, and I've been with a man all the time, like 18 hours a day, on some occasions when we did serious IUC work, when uh, Ibrahim Rasul wanted to label uh, IUC as a terrorist organization. You know that, that famous letter that I wrote, where all the MGC, all of them, sign that, uh, you know, Pagat, all of them, that we're part of a terrorist movement. And um, so I needed to clear the air. I didn't know anything about Shiasm, so I had no opinion about Shiasm. Your uncle didn't teach me about Shiasm. <laughs> My address teachers didn't teach me. So uh, I'm on the record. Uh, saying that but, I'm so a, just to clear, I'm not accusing or saying that you are, but just been discussing history in in that sense, you know. So uh, it, it's the, that that is where the conversation is coming yeah, from. No, I, no, I, 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 I didn't even I, I, I didn't even suspect. So this is the context I am of the only IUC. Sunni in the world that has met all three presidents of Iran. They've got a president uh, who is the supreme leader. Yes. They've got a president who is president of the country. Yes. And they have the president who is a uh, president of the parliament, like the speaker. Yes. I met all three of them. I'm the only Sunni in the world that shook the both, both hands of the supreme leader of Khomeini. Of Iran, and Khomeini. Ra of Iran, the president supreme leader of okay. Iran. I made a mistake by taking his right hand, which was blown off in a bomb incident. Okay. So he shook my hand, but then he gave me his left hand to give me a nice embrace. <laughs> so, so you know, you, you, you speak about liberal and conservative, but people like the Supreme Leader and Shias, they are extremely conservative. I mean, their fiqh is quite conservative. And no. God. I mean, I, 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 other than out of the politics, their fiqh and their, and their worldview and the way which they run their country. This is not a conversation about Shiaism, but we're talking, you know, they're also quite conservative. I, this conservative left is something that is of great interest. No, I don't agree because my per- I went to Iran to stand in for Manila Mandela to start the Al-Aqsa Desh, to bring all the uh, liberation movements of uh, Palestine together. Mm-hmm. I met every Palestine leader in Iran. This was a high-level meeting. What, what year was this, more or less? This was about three, four years ago, just okay. before COVID. 
And I had to rush from Vienna to Tehran, so they wanted a South African Muslim MP to be part of that this, and Mandela couldn't make it. So I was the only one. Mandela, Mandela couldn't make it. Yeah, couldn't make it, yeah. So I was reluctantly thrown in there. And after that, people started accusing me of being a Shia again. Especially, especially, you know, the DA uh, Bolanas, like okay. Said Iso and so on. They, people he's, used he's to phone me. He's also my uncle in some connection. Okay, you know? you've, got, you've got strange <laughs> uncles. You must, you, you, I, I, you know, you can't choose your relatives. So what he used to do is, election time, people used to follow me, Ghanif, Sheikh Said says he's a Shia. I said, wah, he's on the Shura. Then I said, look, it's politics. You know, I'm, you, you know what I am. I'm going to tell you what I am. You know what I am. Okay. No, we, we're closing that. Although I did not, I, 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 just, I just find your, your I, it's a breath of fresh air to hear uh, someone in South Africa actually recognize and try to diagnose and try to talk about the left and right within the Muslim community. And inshallah, one day, I promise we will have a separate discussion on that. And maybe we'll put a panel together to talk about the left and right with, 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 within the Muslim community. I want to talk about Al Jamaa. Yes. I noticed you wearing a T-shirt and I was wondering why is this man wearing a T-shirt? And then I see that the T-shirt looks very nice with the Palestinian scarf edging. That's correct. That's beautiful. Yeah, you, you must remember that I am one of the closest people in South Africa to Hamas. They told me about Al Aqsa flood three years ago. Those are very big statements. I took Hamas to Parliament where everyone was staying away from them. I took them to Parliament. We had a meeting. When was D this? This was uh, towards the end of last year. Oh, when oh when they came now? Because I read. I mean, we did some research. In the in, they were in South Africa in 2017, 2016, I think. There yeah, was a I met them there where the MJC invited me. In 2017, Maria Franchman organized it. Okay. But today I started meeting them. And then after that, the relationship between us and Hamas started growing very strong. Who is us? The Al Jama political party. Al Jama political party. Yeah. So they recognized uh, Al Jama as a reputable organization to be associated with. So when they came to South Africa now recently, yeah. they tell me that we are the first port of call. And no one wanted to meet them. I, I just want us to stop here. And I have to go back into history. Why is it that many individuals like yourself, people who are veterans, 15 minutes ago you told me the PLO. I never mentioned PLO. No, you, 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 you mentioned the PLO in Libya, the meeting in Libya. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, that right, was. Right. I yeah. did, no, I, no, uh, no yeah. just to be correct. So you mentioned the PLO and, and South Africa, the African National Congress, and everyone in liberation uh, were part in... But there was no Hamas there. No, no, just, just we get there. We, we, we're getting there, we're getting there. And everyone had a good relation with the PLO and... Yes, yeah. right? And of course, the PLO made their political decisions, which they are entitled to in terms of what they decided for their struggle. Look, by there. mayor in Joburg, uh, at the statue of uh, Yasser Arafat no. at the municipality in Joburg. Okay, that's great, that's great. Why is it that today how, that, that, that everyone is suddenly talking to Hamas. We don't hear about the PLO. We don't hear of PLO meetings. And I, the question is, have people in South, have entities in South Africa, I mean, entities, individuals, activists, senior activists like yourselves. What if, 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 if you guys decided that, you know what, we don't talk to the PLO anymore, the PLO is on the black, back burner. Even diplomatically, uh, we, 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 we try to reach out to the Minister of, of, of International Relations, uh, Dr. Lady Pandu, we haven't heard back from her yet. I mean, she, she is on public record when the 7th of October happened last year. They phoned Hamas, they phoned Ismail Haniya, Hamas or so, right? Yes. I mean, what I understand and, and you being a parliamentarian, you would understand if there's, if there's something happening in a foreign country, our president or our minister phones the president or the minister there. That's correct. We don't phone the mayor, we don't phone the premier, Yes. right? We would get very upset if Biden called the, pre the, pre the premier of Cape Town for a flood, right? There's protocols. Uh, our, our, our minister called Hamas. I'm, I'm sure they have, they, have, they have a justification for that. that that's, not the, that's not the main question. The main question is, have we in South Africa decided, you know what, we, 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 what is our relation with the PLO? 
Why does the PLO no longer, longer feature as it used to? Because they are, according to the Arab League, they are the sole representatives of the Palestinian issue. Yeah, look, uh, the Marsh policy is to work with all the, uh, everyone was part of the resistance in Palestine, which okay. includes PLO, Hamas, uh, Islamic Jihad, all the other organizations. Like I said, I met all of them in Libya. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it was, uh, I, you know, the, 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 the number one or the number two. But you mean in Iran? Recently. In Iran, yes, yeah. we met all of them there. Uh, and we spent the whole day with them. Uh, to find out how we can save Masjid al-Aqsa and I will do anything with uh, you know for Masjid al-Aqsa even go to Iran okay. and then in, a, in a, an election year you know being uh, I have a danger of being accused to be a Shia and Sunnis mustn't vote for me <laughs> so but uh, Masjid al-Aqsa is more important than all of that so uh, uh, Hamas, Hamas I only came to know Hamas uh, when they came to South Africa, uh, organized by Marius Franzman then. And uh, Hamas was, was promised an office funded by the ANC, which they renegated on. So Hamas, what's, what's your source of this information? Sorry? What's your source of this information? I was there. That, there. We, were, that we were give you an office. When I joined, when who, I entered who said Parliament. We'll give, who said we'll give you an office? The uh, ANC uh, leadership that was there, that we will give you an office, we'll fund the office. The office will be in Cape Town. And uh, some of the people that were present there tell me, Hanif, you know that the ANC promised Hamas an office. They backtracked because they've got this allegiance to Yasser Arafat. And the present leadership of PLO is nowhere near the leadership of Yasser Arafat but that's, and those who are around But him. that's none of our business. That's none it of our business. It is our business I mean, because no, but, but, it is our business because of Masjid al -Aqsa. But it's not our business in terms of, of who runs organizations. So, I mean, how would we feel if, 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 if Putin tomorrow says, you know what, I don't want to deal with South Africa anymore because I like Zuma. Or how would we feel if people don't want to deal with South Africa because of the decisions you, that we you make? You remind me when <laughs> Oliver <laughs> Tambo went to visit the frontline states and uh, Mandela, they asked him now, where's Shubukwe? We don't deal with you, we know Shubukwe. Where, you know, where's Shubukwe? Where do you come from? But that's exactly what you're telling me, Uncle Khanif, that people are saying the PLO is no longer what it used to be. So now let's, let, let's, 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 let's deal with Hamas. No, no, we deal with every day. So Al-Zamar's policy is that we want to have cordial relations with all, the, all those who make up the resistance in Palestine. And uh, the uh, uh, but there are official, PLO is but, performing but, but, a very important role. But there are official should, channels, right? Should, which is that there's a Palestinian embassy, a Palestinian Authority embassy. So we there, work there, with there, the Palestinian there's, there's embassy. There's a government. I visit the Palestinian uh. embassy. We treat the ambassador with respect. She invites us. Uh, our our mayors, uh, you know, have cordial relationship okay. with them. And at the same time, uh, we give Hamas the same respect. The same or more? I'm trying to figure out the protocol. We give Hamas more because... I mean, when I asked you about your T-shirt, you, you immediately went to Hamas. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just trying to understand the protocol and the processes. You know, many people say we must support Hamas, support this one, support that one. I'm interested in understanding what is the rationale, the principle that drives these decisions. Yeah, of, look, of, of, uh, over Hamas the took history. us in our confidence. Okay. They told us that they're very concerned about Masjid al-Aqsa and there will be an Aqsa flood to try and strengthen the resistance to protect Masjid al-Aqsa. And uh, they didn't tell us about October the 7th, but they told us that they've got 30,000 well-trained Hamas people who want to be martyrs. They've signed up, I don't know what, who they signed up, but they took an oath that we want to be a martyr, 30,000. And the reason they want to be a martyr is to save Masjid al -Aqsa. So, so the... So, so, so they confided in us, told us that uh, Hamas is well-trained, 30,000 or 36,000. They're in every town in uh, so-called uh, Israel. They've got battalions there, they've got sleeper cells there and people are waiting to be called up to be martyred. 
You mentioned the word so-called Israel. Well, it's occupied Palestine from the river to the sea. So from okay, the river okay, to okay, the sea, you, 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 from the river okay. to the sea, Hamas has a battalion in every town, major town. I, I want to get to other principles now. Now you open up an interesting discussion for us, you know. And, uh, I enjoy okay, talking. Let's to move back to Al Jabba because no, no, we, I, need, I, we need your listeners' <laughs> vote. You must vote for Al Jabba no. because if uh, Al Jabba is not there, we can't support uh, parties rooted in the liberation movement that will carry on with the hate case. We can't let the moonshot pack people take over. That's the end of the case, the two cases is, that is, I hate. In fact, there are three cases now. Yes. That will be the end. South Africa has got a legal team well prepared for it. And they will then be, you know, uh, it will, that will come to an end. So it's very important that uh, we have, uh, in the, after the election, a, uh, a governing party that supports the uh, action taken uh, uh, against Israel at the Hague. What 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 is what is Al Hamas, what is Al Jama'a's objective in this upcoming election? Even off camera, we mentioned this issue about Gaza and the Hague and so forth, which is led by the current government. So, is the, the where, where does Al where does Al Jama'a see itself post twenty twenty four elections? Look, we feel that we need to have at least four or five seats in national parliament. That's how many votes, more or less? That's how many votes have you calculated that to be? 400,000. 400,000 votes. So 100,000 for a vote. More or less. More, more or less, more or less. Although more I got my seat with 40,000. Yes. I've just doubled it. We'll get to that. We'll get, we'll get to the secret of that. So oh. I've not voted back into parliament. I'm out of a job. I must sell newspapers. <laughs> No, I think I think we we will we'll, we'll have podcasts on left and right <laughs> politics in the Muslim world, which I really doubt. But what 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 is what is your what is look, your we, what, what is your numerical objective? So if you look at what the Chief Justice uh, Bukweng Bukweng stated when he made a commentary, he stated that uh, Al Jama. Less than 1% of the vote runs the largest metro in Africa. And by the way, we're doing it very well. We've got a first-class mayor, we've got a first-class audit, and we're turning Joburg into a first-class city. Believe it or not, whereas other three political parties all messed up over the last five years. How do you, and not, uh, not, 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 not disbelieving you, but just asking you, how do you evaluate that 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 you've turning Joburg around? Residents in Joburg are constantly complaining. Uh, b- b- Look, you b- must b- remember that the ANC Action SADA messed up that city, and it will normally would take a, a a century to fix it. So now comes Al Jama, has the confidence of nine political parties, and they tell us take the lead. And we are holding the mayoral power for one the, full year. Who other political parties that are supporting you? It's the EFF, it's the ANC, it's the PAC, it is uh, a Patriotic Alliance, uh, it is AIC, and uh, uh, one or two other other parties. You can't expect to remember okay, no, no. all their names. So I mean, it, it, I mean, th- there's there's a question which many ask, and this is where, the, where this is when we were sitting there. I said, Uncle Hanif, it is your liberation credentials that has a question mark over it. And the question that, that, that I'll ask you straightforward is, I mean, yourself and, 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 and a few other people in the political space like yourself, it seems that with you, you are too close to the ANC. So are we voting for Al Jamaa or are we voting for an ANC satellite, ANC light? Look, we call the ANC Al Jamaa light. When we had the deputy president called a conference on uh, coalitions, uh, we said that the ANC is Al Jama light. ANC not, is Al Jama light. Al Jama light, and that that got a standing ovation because we are reimagining politics, and um, we are the party that just has the strongest voice against the ANC because of their corruption. We don't vote with the ANC all the time. But without the ANC, let me, let me if tell, you couldn't have a mayor. Without no, the, without, no, without, without, the ANC, without, the ANC, without a party with one sheet, like AIC, uh, we won't have a mayor. So all of them are important. If the AIC pulls out in Joburg, 
then uh, the DA takes over, and then Joe Book will have a have white rule again. But at the national level, you also then very close to the ANC on other issues. No, in Parliament, so you in December, to, yes. the chairman of the ANC came to me, Gwede Mantashi. He said, you voted against us three times in a row. This is a trend. Isn't the chief whip looking after you? What do you want that you're not getting uh, in terms of support? Look, we've never asked the ANC for anything. We will never ask them for anything. For the last 17 years, we helped them in escort to run that municipality, in Harding to run that municipality, Last week I went to Durban to save their butt from losing Durban, and in Joburg, of course. When they had the speaker, when the when the speaker was uh, about three weeks ago, there was an issue with the speaker. There's now no another conference. issue because the EFF has decided to join the DA against the ANC in Durban, but they can't remove the present mayor because of Aldermar's one vote. They need that vote, so I had to go down to Durban and uh, sit and sit my councillor down and tell him about Khan, this is your orders. You will carry out my order or you're gone. Uh, are, are you at privy to say what the orders were? Or the controlled? orders were that they must make sure that the DA don't run the city of, of Durban. Is your, is, is, I mean, we're jumping from place to place, but, but I'm sure the, the viewers will follow the conversation. What is your principle? Uh, you, you mentioned something interesting in liberation anti-America. Are you principally the anti-DA, irrespective of what DA does? No matter how much good DA does, no, can, no, can the DA uh, never do any good no, because no. of the position on Gaza? We, we are, I uh, have a position and Alan Zillis spoke to me. She okay. wanted our vote for Joburg. Okay. She knows me well. She came to one of my nephew's wedding. Do, we do, met there. Okay. So she feels free to phone me. And I told her, Alan, look, your position on events in Palestine is a deal breaker. What, what, why, why is Palestine a deal breaker when we have, I mean, so, so hear me out. We've got, we've got numerous issues in South Africa. I don't need to tell you, everyone knows it. Palestine is a very important issue. And as a government, as, as part of parliament, it is falls within South African foreign policy. We have bigger foreign policy failures. We have foreign policy failures that's leading us to immigration, which we'll talk about, our border security. Uh, we have foreign policy issues that impacts on our commerce. We have foreign policy issues relating to the splitting of Sudan, to what's happening in Darfur. Our, our soldiers are getting killed in Congo. These are all foreign policy issues. Why is Gaza and that not another po foreign policy issue, which we can say we agree, we disagree, and so forth and so forth. And by the way, the DA's position is a two-state solution, negotiated, and, and I mean, from what I understand, the DA's position on, 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 on Palestine and Israel, it's almost, it's almost in step with the South African government position, which is a two-state solution. Is, 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 is that not so? I mean, there's a lot of rhetoric going around from numerous politicians. Yeah, we oppose but, but, the INC's position on Palestine. We believe in a one state, one man, one vote. We don't believe in a two-state solution. And uh, when I went to Parliament, my first speech was to the INC, Palestine arranged for you to get weapons. I told you about it early mm, on. Mm, mm. We want you to send weapons to Palestine, to all the resistance movements, so they can defend themselves against Israel. That was my first speech in Parliament. So, uh, so you must understand that uh, when it comes to Palestine, first of all, uh, 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 we are, the only reason is while the occupation is important, it's all about Masjid al-Aqsa. We have such a deep love for Masjid al-Aqsa. We don't say it's the third holiest mosque. al Jamal says it's one of the three holiest mosques. It's not the third mosque. So Masjid al-Aqsa is very important for us in al Jamal, for myself growing up. I'll do anything for Masjid al-Aqsa. I even went to Iran. I even went to Iran. Because remember earlier on, I was invited uh, by Iran to commemorate 25 years of Khomeini. Ahmad Kassim was supposed to go. I was his 2IC, he couldn't go. He asked me to go. And then Iran refused me a, vi a visa because I'm a stone Sunni. Okay. I had my ticket in Joburg. They had my passport. I filled in the visa forms recommended by the top CIs in Cape Town. Iran turned it down. They didn't want a stone Sunni to come. 
So, 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 you're, so, we go keep on going back there. <laughs> we keep going back there. I'm not shaking my head. So, you you refuse cooperation with Helen Ziller because of their position on 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 uh, on, on Masjid Al Aqsa and the occupation in Palestine. What what part of their position is it that you because they believe in a two state solution? Well, which uh, is what which is what we, which is which is our uh, government's uh, position? They they stand with Israel. So when the when the Mayor Palachi, Dr. Palachi, stood up in front of three hundred Zionists in Joburg, she said, "I stand with Israel." I phoned my team, uh, Imam Councillor Tapelo Ahmed Bubakar. I phoned the present Mayor Kabelo Kwamanda Imran Bosa. I said, "Your instructions are to remove Palachi." And I give you one year to do it. So, 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 so. Ah, now, 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 I'm getting somewhere. So, you, you, you differentiate, or the two-state solution is that something that that that's one that's one discussion. Standing with Israel so vehemently and so publicly, is it the texture and the nature of what that project? Look, you must remember, it's uh, 30 years uh, Palestine was under British oppression and then 75 years under Israel. So that's over a hundred years. And uh, this oppression is backed by the Zionists, funded by the Zionists. They have captured America, they've captured the Western Cape. And um, so uh, we feel strongly against uh, the scourge of Zionism. And, 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 and do you in your in your analysis and diagnosis, do you believe, for, what, for whatever evidence you have, that the DA is a Zionist-funded or Zionist movement or Zionist uh, uh, a supporter? Is 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 that the bottom? Is yes, that the bottom because line? my counselors tell me that uh, the DA who runs the city of Cape Town and the province of the Western Cape. I've got an MPL in uh, in the Western Cape and three councillors uh, in the municipality that the DA has sold off half of the land in Cape Town to Zionists and given them option to buy the land. And they're openly inviting Zionists to come to Cape Town. They've built flats for Zionist settlers to come to Seapoint. The Zionist settlers are not taking up the offer because of the protests in Seapoint that we had recently. So now they're opening up to others. So the evidence is there that uh, the uh, uh, Western Cape is going to become a a, a Zionist uh, a, a city controlled by, they already control the, the city in terms of land. Land is very important. So they have the land, but we're going to expropriate that land without compensation. And here we work with the EFF very closely to make sure that happens. And we try to work with the ANC and influence them. We were part of a party to party meeting on expropriating land without compensation. But the INC, you know, didn't agree with us, like we don't agree with them on many other issues. For example, the Sloppy matter, we voted against the impeachment of Sloppy, okay. because that was a Zuma thing, uh, nothing more than that. But that's another story. So we are convinced that, uh, you know, uh, the Democratic Alliance is heavily funded by the Zionists and the do, Minister do, do, of Defense, the Minister have, of evidence, Intelligence, have evidence for the that? Minister of Intelligence has talks about a coup d'etat, a regime change. So this is a regime change of a, like it's a different kind of regime change. Normally, when you have regime change, it's a military. This is where political parties are funded by the Zionists to win an election. But but at the end of the day, as a South African, I view. Any any attack on our institutions, the, the, uh, anyone who attacks, is of course, the, the enemies. But in the w within the ANC, the ANC spoke about state capture. The ANC said that their own people, and we had a whole commission. I don't know how many billion was spent on state capture yes, within yeah. the ANC. So so I mean that's like the the pot calling the kettle black. Now the only difference is now that it's 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 people from overseas and then there's capitalists and there's white minority capital. Yeah, look, so, uh, so that, in, look. Uh, in, in South Africa, there seems to be a lot of fear mongering. You know, if it's if it's not if it's not EFF singing kill the boer, it's Bongen and Gema singing about the Indians. If it's not that, then it's people saying they're Zionists. There's always some boogeyman in South African politics and politicians 
are always saying there's a boogeyman. I think I won't say it's convenient, but it's also not surprising that the leader of a Muslim party uh, that's very successful as your Jama'ah uh, chooses the, 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 the staple Muslim boogeyman, the Zionist, the staple Muslim global issue, Palestine. From a political perspective, it's, 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 it's very... Yeah, it's, I think it's, history it's, it's will... Very, it's very convenient. I think history will commend Al Jamaa for pushing that narrative that the, uh, there has been a Zionist plan to take over the Western Cape. One billion rand has been budgeted by the Zionists to capture the ulama in the Western Cape. Do you have evidence for this? Yes, plans? we have the evidence. Many of them went to the Ulu. When, 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 you, when you say Zionists, do you mean, are these individuals coming with money? Is it companies? Is it, is it a government? No, this is the DA directly. The, the DA? So they, they fund uh, people that go to Ulooms. And when they return, they will make sure that their children go to Model C schools, have cars, stand as counselors, uh, stand as, uh, uh, you know, all the civil society structures. They put them in place to garner the vote. The DA at the moment has 25 ulama who are, who they call influencers. Young ulama who are on TikTok. And they are ready to make sure that the DA don't lose the Muslim vote. So the youngsters are very impressed with these young ulama. They have been heavily funded. The parents have been funded by the DA for the last 15 years. This is a 15 year project. But, uh, but all political parties, I won't say necessarily, but all political parties engage in social media, fund people who they like, fund people for, 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 for their projects. A lot of all political parties have, have patronage. In, have, have, uh, you know, all political parties have, 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 have patronage. We don't have a rent to fund anyone, so you, know, you must count us out. We're <laughs> not out. in that league, so I don't understand that how <laughs> that works. I don't think the INC has cheap skates, you can't get any money out of them. And, uh, you know, so it's only the DA that does it. I don't think any other party has funding or money to do what you're suggesting. It's only the DA who came up with a plan, 15-year plan, to capture the MJC. So the CEO of the MJC is a DA's former DA speaker. The, uh, 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 the DA has placed... Uh, uh, who, who is that? Sheikh Saeed Iso. 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 Yeah. Is, is, is he still in the, in the ANC? Yeah, he's the CEO Sorry, of the MJC. Sorry, he's still in the MJC. Okay. And he's also CEO of the Laltra, the CFO of the Laltra. So he controls all the money. I, 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 and he's a DA a deploy. I, I want to ask something. This is also something that happens in the Muslim community. Irrespective of the merits of the DA, the merits of anything. Are we saying that, that scholars or South Africans or whoever it is, if someone decides to be with a certain political party, does it, why, why can't it be that someone decides, you know what, I, I subscribe to the DA, I agree with certain parts of the DA, I disagree with certain parts of the DA, and me being a person of whatever stature, I've made this decision. Why is it that people of the Muslim community who join the DA uh, have, have to be part of the conspiracy theory? I think it's the same like many people believe it's, it's, that people who join the ANC, uh, there was a time when people who were in the ANC, Muslims were viewed, oh, they're communists, they're, pro, uh, uh, they're pro-legalizing abortion, they're pro-legalizing alcohol. Why? Because they're joining the ANC. Th does it mean that someone who joins the ANC or the DA necessarily has to agree with everything. Maybe people who join the ANC or the DA or the EFF say, you know what, there are parts I disagree with, but I have a program or something which I believe in, like yourself, and, and hence I'm comfortable with this part of it. Look, you, wha, 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 you, you, those people who you now have a quarrel with, they will say, but we were right because the DA supports Israel who are the most brutal killers on earth. They are not human beings, they are savages. And for a political party like the DA to say, we stand with Israel. Uh, we believe in a two-state solution. And they know that Israel doesn't support a two-state solution. So, I mean, it's very, they say so because they know that it will never happen. Israel doesn't support a two-state solution. But they say, we stand with Israel. And, I think that's the issue. So with when they I say, we your... stand with Israel, it's not for a two-state solution but is to slaughter Palestinians and, uh, and the rule from the river to the sea. 
and move uh, 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 Palestinians to the desert. So that is a long-term plan uh, uh, that uh, the DA subscribes to. And it's nothing about this two-state solution. They know that there's no two-state solution. So it's easy to say that. But when they say we stand with Israel, that's the crux of the matter. Is they that the stand, crux of them? They stand with the occupation. They stand with a killer army, kills babies, women and children, ignores the United Nations. But I don't blame Israel. I blame America. America now wants to do in, uh, in Palestine, they now want to do in South Africa. And they're starting with the Western Cape and they're using the DA uh, to do their dirty work in the Western Cape to secede and to have a referendum. And if they, uh, if they, the, moon, the moonshot pack uh, runs the country, uh, the referendum says uh, Western Cape becomes the 55th state of Africa, the national government will support it. The ANC obviously won't support it now, so it will never happen. But when the moonshot pack comes and South Africa is the first country in Africa to have a white president, then that will happen. So we have to understand that there is nothing worse that the Muslim can do than to support Israel and support the DA who stands with Israel. Even, even if the DA or any political, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, there are other political parties the also ACDP, support Israel. Even worse than the DA. So even if these political parties in our local and national context have good policies, have good implementation, have ideas which you and them can, can execute, if the DA or ACDP or Mokhweng Mokhweng was also very pro-Israel, if they come and say, the, yeah, is something relating to us in South Africa, we can work on it, it can work, you will not work of them, with them because they stand with Israel. Look, is that uh, the we principle? are not like the other political parties who stand up in parliament and say, note the objection of the uh, Freedom Front Plus, note the objection of the ACDP. We will look at every motion on its merits. So 80% of the motions that are proposed by the DA, many political parties, including the al Jamaa, will support it okay. on its merits. You will support so that has happened. Okay. Uh, but I, I when, it comes, when it comes to, uh, you know, these other matters, uh, where they want to turn the Western Cape into a Zionist state, we're vehemently opposed to okay. it. I think it's very important that we articulate that, that there are positions which the DA and other entities, who sub, other parties who, sub, who stand with Israel, when they propose things in Parliament, and you see there is benefit in it for South Africans, you have supported these motions. Yes, look like, for example, when it comes to load shedding and they introduce measures to reduce the, the load, shedding level, load shedding level by one, we must support it. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, in the Western Cape Parliament, uh, uh, we will vote against their budget because it's a discriminatory budget, it's a constantia uh, budget. Constantia loaded. It's a constantia budget. And, uh, and uh, you know, so uh, our MPL, uh, by the way, when he votes, he first recites Surah Fatiha. And uh, so, uh, you know, the verses of the Quran verberates in the Western Cape Parliament. And uh, so, our position is quite clear uh, that uh, the what is very important is Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay. We'll do anything for Masjid al-Aqsa. Like I oh. said, I even go to Iran. <laughs> right? And uh, by the way, they want me to come again. Uh, you can't go to Iran in an election here. Yeah? You, lose, you lose a lot of votes. You're six. I you just say, he's a He went to Iran to wear us. Every member of the MGC went to Iran. Every member of the senior MGC went to Iran. But not MC, every member of the MGC is, uh, is a president of a political party. Okay, okay. Well, uh, we respect the ulama. Uh, they have more status than the leader of a political party. So, uh, so the position on the DA is quite clear that they support a country and its policies that is policies and positions that is the worst ever in our civilization. And that's why the world needs a new civilization. The present civilization 
uh, led by America, Germany, uh, 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 has to now give way to a new humanitarian civilization to embrace the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There is no civilization now existing that can say that we subscribe to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So that is uh, sadly the case because the countries that have been pushing that was America, was England, was Germany. And um, so uh, the world does not have a civilization that it can be proud of. The present civilization are barbaric. They kill babies, they kill women. They've got no respect for human life. They break the Geneva, sorry, the Convention on Genocide, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They support Israel. Uh, they supply weapons to kill the babies, the women, the elderly. So there is a need for a new humanitarian civilization and by South Africa is now taking the lead. By ta go, taking the matter to The Hague and many other countries are following, following it. Excellent. We have to take a break. This is In Conversation with Uncle Hanif Hendricks, President of Al Jamaa. We'll be back after this. In Conversation With is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry Crown Mines. In Conversation With Uncle Hanif Hendricks, President and Fund of Al Jamaa. Elections are around the corner. Uh, that is, we're counting down. I looked at your manifesto. I appreciate it's, I, I, it's a lot to read. It's a lot to read. I appreciate the detail. I appreciate, I think, I, not I think, the EFF also has quite a detailed manifesto. It's not just a bunch of political statements, which I'm used to in most of the other manifestos. Who's the brainchild of the manifesto? And what is the core focus of your manifesto, of your agenda, of your, of, 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 of your proposed program? I'm the brainchild. I discussed it with our CEO, who is Professor Muhammad Arun, and he has a team of advocates that he consults. And what my ideas was, they put in that document that is very comprehensive. What are the top three ideas that makes you different, so, unique, so, and easy, and actually implementable? So, so uh, you've got to give me a chance to explain that. Uh, we, our manifesto is different to other political parties. I will take the issue of jobs. The DA says that they want two million jobs. The ANC says two and a half million jobs. Aldama says, no, we don't want so many jobs. Now that may cost us votes. But what we're saying is we want decent jobs. We feel that uh, South Africa has signed the Convention on Decent Work, which means that when you create a job, it must have all the social benefits, medical aid, pension fund, housing, bursaries. So the guy with the flag on the street who's employed on a daily rate not of a decent benefits, job. That's, that's not... That's, that is a social welfare matter. So, 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 so decent job does not refer to the moral or social coding of the job. It refers to legal implications, meaning Pension, labor rights, medical aid, labor, labor rights, etc. It's not, it's and, not and South Africa signed the Convention on Decent Work. Mandela got the first annual award and we need a second one for promoting decent work. So decent work is not only the social benefits, but development opportunities in that particular job. So we don't want stone age jobs. So I've got experience in creating next generation jobs. That's why I got the award as pioneer of the internet. And that created millions of jobs. You wouldn't have had Facebook, internet, Instagram. So, so your viewers and listeners must say, say thank you, Al Jamaa, and vote for us. Just for, just for creating uh, those social media opportunities. But we go further than the ANC and the DA. We say we want decent work plus full employment. So full employment is not a pipe dream for a country in Africa. The what does full employment mean? Full employment means that every person who's able to work in the country gets a job. So the fiscal policy must be designed in such a way that the private sector has to create the jobs. We don't want government to create one job. That's not their job. They want other work to do. So you believe in, in do, you, do you believe in smaller government, in trimmed government? 
No, no, no. We, uh, you know, that's a different subject. It's but a different when it subject. Comes to jobs. It it's a job of the private sector. If you want to do business in Africa, you got to create full employment. Like when Libya took over, when Gaddafi uh, kicked out the Italians, I think it was the intelligence, the colonial power was the Italian. He made sure that Libya, every person in Libya that could um, work got a job and all the resources to make it successful. But not a job, but uh, a living opportunity. So if they didn't work in a factory or manufacturing, he gave them a farm. What cows and a tractor and sheep and vegetables and poison and fertilizer. So his fiscal policy, which was like a dictatorship, whereas ours is more, you know, democratic. Uh, he forced his world that everyone has to work yet control the fiscus. So the fiscal policy, it will take a couple of years uh, to put it in place. But uh, so first of all, decent work and full employment. And we feel that in that way, our Aljamaa's position on jobs is different to all other political parties. We've got a triple whammy. Their jobs are slave jobs. And but, their but salaries the, are slave salaries. But they must say you have to start somewhere. Those are no, the no, no. Points. The point is that a person must have a living wage from day one. Once you enter the labor market, you must have a living wage. You must be able to, and this is our criteria, one hot plate of food every day. Compute that, and that's what you must earn. So uh, then it comes to our, our charter of rights. The constitution says you've got access to water, but then you must walk five kilometers and when you come to the river, you must throw stones at the dogs so your bucket can go and scoop up some water. We say, no, there must be a right to water. So it's a constitutional obligation to provide clean, drinkable water. Then we say there must be universal health care. That a person must not die because they can't afford to pay for medical care. So at the moment in South Africa, if we have money, you live. We don't have money, you die. But, but that's oversimplification. I mean, the no, moment... now let me tell you, we put our money where our mouth is. Uh, we throw our weight behind a service provider called Net Clinic. They've established 10 primary health care centers, which are models of the National Health Insurance Act. And it's working. The only difference is... It is modern, no waiting time, it's, everything is high-tech. What do you mean you supported this? What, what, what's your relation to this, proje to this project? Look, I have to disclose that uh, the reason we were interested in this project, besides me serving on the Portfolio Committee for Health and developing, help developing the NHI legislation, I was in the thick of things. I gave a lot of time uh, to the NHI because it was struggling for 10 years before I came on the scene and started pushing that the N every other political party besides the ANC was against the NHI. We pushed it, supported the ANC. And uh, so when my son, who's got an MBA, told me, Dad, I've got some time to study. What was I study? I said, do your PhD in NHI. Then he got some activists to fund him. And together they've started, they've rolled out 10 model clinics in Kailitsa, in uh, Mitchell's Plain, in the Strand, and now in the white areas like Botasach. So the only difference is that the patient pays 350 rand for a nurse, a doctor, medicine, and a follow-up visit, whereas the NHI, it's free. So until the NHI comes in, people have to pay and obviously it's subsidized by these female activists who also believe that South Africa should have a universal health care. So everyone is against the NHI. Where's the money going to come from? So we've shown that it can work. There are 10 uh, 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 models working in the Western Cape and they're rolling out a hundred. So it is how we feel that health care must be a right and not access. Then we go on to 
uh, 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 personal safety. We feel that it must be a constitutional right for personal safety. If someone comes and attacks you in your home, it means the police haven't done their job, they haven't carried out their mandate, and they've been breached of the constitution. So our rights charter also speaks about torture. It speaks about uh, mass surveillance. So at the moment, I serve on the ad hoc committee drawing up new security legislation. You know that CODESA, all the spies of apartheid are still in employment. Some of them have died, but they are still all over. And that's why we had the 221 July address. They are placed there so that when the regime change comes, they are there to play their role. So the present legislation is supported by the ANC and the DA because they want to torture and they want mass surveillance. They use these people grabbers. being tortured in South Africa? Yes. I you mean, ask I... the packet guys how they were tortured. You ask the tool chitons how they were tortured. You ask any gang leader how they are tortured. You ask any drug smuggler how they are tortured. They are brutally tortured by the same people that were torturing during apartheid, still torture today under the watchful eye of the ANC. So we're not very, we don't speak favorably of the ANC all the time. So I oppose the ANC as a member of the ad hoc committee with their new legislation, which is supported by the DA. Now the DA supports this draconian legislation because they say we're going to rule South Africa. But we do have a v not supporting the current legislation and I don't understand what it is about and I don't understand and don't know the, the facts we talk about torture. Uh, but I mean, under the current security failures, security issues we have, uh, is, is, is this the appropriate time to say, let's relax legislation relating... The Constitution says there must be no torture. Okay. So the Constitu when, when, uh, when uh, the Constitution was established, after the, the TRC Commission's identification of how people were brutally tortured, and uh, Imam Harun was one of them, yeah, uh, it was a 10 pound hammer every day for 100 days. That's the kind of thing. So people said, we don't want an intelligence service in South Africa. Don't provide for it in the constitution. So the compromise was civilian oversight. So we have a inspector general of civilian, uh, 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 of intelligence, uh, a Muslim guy. And uh, he came to complain to my portfolio, to my ad hoc committee and says that this legislation strips all my powers. I can't do civilian oversight. So I asked him now, how must we change the legislation? He says, well, I've got 20 amendments. So we have sent al Jamaa people to seven provinces to make submissions to strengthen the powers of the Inspector General of Intelligence. I sat down with the Minister of Intelligence and he says, look, al Jamaa, you've made your point. You will get the 20 amendments. So that is the type of role we are playing. And, uh, and, and in combating crime, people want, people want to, how does that make citizens safer? Because you, you spoke about personal safety, then we say well, the problem is we're torturing quote unquote criminals. So what-, what, you, what, what, you, what you see that African sign, uh, Ahmed Kassim was a very strong proponent because he was tortured. He knows how it is to be tortured. We signed a convention against torture. You can't sign an international convention and say, look, let's torture the gangsters because they're drug dealers and so on. It doesn't work like that. That's uncivilized behavior and uncivilized attitude, not for this modern age. They've got to find ways for those gangsters to talk other than torture. Torture after we went through torture during apartheid. We can't say now, don't torture activists. Don't torture Hanif Hendricks. Uh, you know, don't torture you know, this one and that one, but torture this one and this one because they're gangsters. So we feel that the, our, our rights charter should prevent mass surveillance. At the moment, there are grabbers which the DA buys from Israel that can capture all your emails, all your conversations. They bring in artificial intelligence and you're an expert in artificial intelligence. You know what you're talking about. I know about artificial intelligence 10 years ago already. I've got a bit of idea of what it is when we started the internet. We knew the internet will play a important role in artificial intelligence. So, um, so, so uh, mass surveillance 
uh, is what America wants. And uh, we are falling to the trap with Rika, uh, you know, with all these uh, capturing people's personal information. So in the city of Joburg, we are in the, we are in the Supreme Court of Appeal because we accused the DA of using the grabber to spy on councillors. And uh, so we feel that that's an invasion of privacy, is unconstitutional, and the security legislation, police must not be allowed to, you know, to just willy-wally have mass surveillance of what we do in our private lives. They will eventually know every girlfriend I have, <laughs> every date I am on, who wants uh, you know, to allow that. So while I'm in Parliament, I'm not going to allow it. <laughs> Uncle Hanif, what, 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 what are the reasons why South Africans should trust a party that has barely 1%? What is your track record? Well, first of all, uh, Jeff <coughs> Radebi was sent by the ANC before Jesse Duarte died. She arranged for me to come down to Joburg. And when I came down and Jeff Radebi and the Deza, the Minister of Agriculture, and Lesufi, the Premier of Gauteng, they said, you know, you're coming all the way from Cape Town for us to give you a message from the NEC, but we were ordered to give it to you personally. This is a three-minute meeting. All we want to tell you is that the African National Congress trusts you. Nothing else. Then in Joburg, nine political parties meet with me. We sit down and they tell me, We've, we've agreed that al Jamaa must lead this coalition. I said, but we're only 1%. We never asked to, be, to lead Joburg, but they did a good choice because we've led it now for one year, whereas the ANC lasted three weeks, Palachi lasted two months, Herman Masaba lasted three months. We're there a year now because we gave them from al Jamaa. We gave them two buyers. We gave them an imam and an activist. And the mayoral parlor has for one year been run by a first-class mayor. Let's say two first-class mayors, not one, two. And we got a first-class audit and on the way to create a first-class city. So what is the measure? The measure was 20 accelerated programs which excluded potholes because the IDP identified 20 urgent. We got the funding. I spoke to the Premier, make sure that he releases the money, no delays. And then in December, the 20 project was evaluated, thumbs up. It was December 2023. Which December? 2023. Thumbs but that's, up. But that's electioneering. No, that's December. We're now into... But that's convenient four months before elections. But remember but that's exactly that, what everyone is talking about. Remember that credit. <laughs> but that's exactly what we in Joburg are talking about. No, that it's credit that doesn't go to al uh, It goes to nine political parties who've made it happen. We just gave the leadership. So al provides leadership, what uh, Chief Justice calls the al effect. I'm, I, must, I must congratulate you. I mean, I met you first in Lanasia in 2012, 2011. Uh, when you were starting and you were meeting people and, and engaging people at that time. Did, 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 did you, and, and congratulations to you, because there are many parties who are like you have one seat or two seats, but like UDM, ACDP, etc. None of them have ever had a mayor. I don't even if the IFP had a mayor. Of a, of, 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 a, of, a ma of a major city in Johannesburg. Look, it's only, so, it's, only it's, that it's, we have a deputy mayor, we've got a speaker, We've got a chief whip. We've got a, a vice chairman of, of a economic. So where, where we, so it is not, Joburg is not just a fluke. It's, uh, it is happening wherever al is, except in the Western Cape, because of a position what, on, what? on Israel. Uh, we don't get the DA to offer us on the merits, senior positions to govern. So we govern in one way in Joburg, in Durban, in Harding, in Escort. In the KZN? Yeah. Okay. But we don't govern as mayor, but 
I mean speaker, uh, 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 chief whip, uh, uh, vice chair of a portfolio you, committee. It, and we only have one seat in that town. We've got a few issues to cover in, in a bit of a press time. You mentioned earlier uh, the relation between blacks and Indians. Uh, your two mayors in Johannesburg were, were the two, two mayors in Johannesburg are blacks. You mentioned in parts that are in the heart of Zululand, like <laughs> the areas where you are, Harding and so forth. Uh, what's 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 Al Jamaa's? If you would like to talk more about the Muslim uh, black relationship, you're welcome to. Uh, I also want to understand what what is the composition of your of your constituents. Yeah, look, one of my failures in the MSA was to bridge the gap between African Muslim leaders and Indian Muslim leaders. And then in Al Jamaa, one of my failures is that I can't get the black. Uh, Indian ulama, the to black, ex the black, sorry, the black ulama, uh -huh. the black, the African ulama, uh, to come nearer to the chairmen of mosques who are Indians, the mosque committees, other ulama who grades them as second class maulanas because of the color of their skin. I failed in trying to bridge the gap. I engage with the Sura Council, who are, which are largely uh, African uh, 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 ulama. And uh, I have had discussions with African intellectuals in the treasury, in government, because I meet all of them. Mm. And when I raise the issue uh, about improving relations, they say that they've given up on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Muslim Indians. Uh, they are still being treated like dogs. They're very strong about it. And, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure there are historical reasons for that. In the year 2024... Yeah, but I'm trying 17 years in, to in bridge the, the in, gap in, and I failed. In the year 20... There are definitely historical when I issues. Go, when I go to Pretoria, my good friend Nazir, Mr. Briggs, when I tell Nazir, Nazir, can't you speak to your Indian billionaires, billionaires, who fund these Maulanas and Indians and mosque committees to improve relations. He said, don't bring up that topic. Uh, you know, it's a sore point. We can't succeed. It will always be like that. People are like that. And, and, so uh, that's but, but, one but, of my failures that but, I can't but, but bring. Many, but many businessmen or many South African, quote unquote, you know, uh, Indian Muslims and so forth would say, We've been doing it at all the years. We've been funding mosques. We've been funding That's projects. That's what I tell the black ulama. And, so then, I should, and, and, and so many people in the community say, well, we've been funding and funding and funding. And, and so what, I what, what people what, what like you guys uh, want Malik to Arafat with uh, all um, these uh, top intellectuals in the Muslim African uh, community. And I tell them that, you know, this is what Indians are doing way beyond what they should be doing. Way beyond in any other community, you find that, you know, Indians are generous, they fund, they support, they develop. Why do you still like that? So it's all about power. The Indians want, don't want to even share power. They want control all the time. It's all about control. But what's wrong if... So I tell them, what about, don't worry about control so long as you get the money and children can go for But what's wrong if I'm living in Lanasia or if you're living in Mitchell Spin or you're living in Athlone? And because you're living in Athlone, you want to control your mosque, your school, your community in Athlone. What's wrong if you're living in an Indian area or colored area? And what's wrong if you're living in Soweto and you want to control so your in Soweto? all those arguments I mean, put, I, all those arguments I mean, but, but both before. ways. I mean, I, I, I can't live in lands all, and want to control I the mosque in Soweto. I put all those arguments in front of them as their equals, as a, they respect me as a member of parliament. I put all those arguments in front of them. And they're quite clear that it's all about domination. What's they're the, sick and tired of being dominated by people because of the color of the skin. What is the symptoms and the outcome of this animosity of the, or this issue that you're talking about? The polarization. Let me tell you what happened in 221. I had frantic calls that the Indians in Durban were going to be massacred and their business burned down. So every ulama body in KZN was on the Zoom meeting called by Maulana Khan. People, ulama bodies who fight one another all came to this meeting. So at the end of the meeting, they told me, look, you are the politician. 
you solve the problem. You make sure that we're not massacred, they don't throw our businesses, don't rape our women. So what did I do? I said with my team, I told them, look, we need Zuma. I'm going to call for Zula's pa Zuma's pardon in Parliament tomorrow. I have a, but on Monday or Tuesday, I have an opportunity uh, to speak to the president. Which so president? I tell the president. Of the Republic. Yeah, I tell him, President, I only have three minutes to speak. I tell him, Zuma has been sentenced for, for one year for contempt of court. I don't want to go into the merits. I'm not saying that the Constitutional Court is wrong. But it's in your power to do what I'm going to ask you. Pardon him. Is that where the is that where that came from? Yes. It, pardon him. Did that did that call for pardoning come from Alzama? From me? Yes, I know it came from you. Did is that the background to it? Yes. That it was the Durban riots, and the ulama spoke Look, to you. The riots didn't start yet. They were scared it's going to happen. Happen. It was in that period. They were impish on the way to do it. Zuma sent out. Zuma's people contacted me. They said we've stopped them. We've stopped them because you're the only person in parliament, not even the ANC. Uh, Zuma's ardent supporters had the guts to stand up and tell Ramaphosa, pardon him. He said, you went further. You did all the documentation for the pardon. So we sat through the night. We had to write to the Minister of Justice to put the case for a pardon. So are you seeing the polarize in your analysis, the polarization of, of Indian black relations? <laughs> partially led or led to your to your call for the pardon of president. That's correct. And because the uh, the uh, we also had a separate Zoom meeting uh, with Indian with African ulama. They said the Zulus, sorry, the impis are coming. They're gonna kill us for first before the Indians. Because we are collaborators with the Indians. We run their mosques, we run their feeding schemes, we give out their hampers. So they were even, so we had every ulama body on the first Zoom meeting. And then we had uh, the, uh, uh, the second just with African ulama. They said that, uh, you, you know, it is not the Indian communities that are the target. They're first going to come for us because we work in those communities, in the African communities. We are there. They must still come to the Indian areas. We are living here. They're going to, on their way to the Indian areas, to rape the women, to burn down the businesses, to kill as many as they can, they will they will kill us on the way. I, I, I you you made you made an example, and thanks for that. Uh, how many Muslims are in South Africa? Are you a Muslim party? Yes, look, uh, we've done the number crunching. Uh, we calculate that there are going to be five million registered Muslim voters. More than half of them uh, just will just be of the diaspora. By when? But when I say uh, it's not necessarily African, it also includes the Middle East people and Just so on. You are saying there will be? Yes, five billion. Eligible voters? Eligible voters. By when? In five years' time. So that is in 2029. There will be five million eligible Muslim voters? Yes. At the moment... How did you arrive? To at the moment, point? many of them still has a year to go for their naturalization and all of those things. But uh, we went to different communities, the Somalis, the Pakistanis. We took the temperature. Have you applied for citizenship? I read the stats in Home Affairs. I serve on the Portfolio Committee for Home Affairs. I get all the figures. So, so formally, so, so, so officially, how many Muslims are in South Africa now today? The latest number you've come across. Look, according to the surveys, it's three and a half million. Which According surveys? to the census that was done last year, is that it's three and a half million? Is that has that have that census been published with yes, the amount of Muslims? Three and a half million uh, Muslims, uh, but uh, 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 so uh, they you have to add two figures. The one figure is, let's call it locals, Malays, Indians, and the other figure is African, sorry, is Muslims from the African diaspora and from the Middle East and Pakistan and, and so Asia. on. So you've got to do a bit of adding up. So you won't find five billion. Of course not. Yeah, you'll have to add it up. And, uh, you know, once you have a South African ID, uh, I also serve on the IEC, on the national forums. And uh, 
So, so we've computed all that information. So I tell my uh, campaign team that they have a long-term view for 2029, work on 5 million, and make sure we get 2.5 billion votes. So that's our target. You, 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 you want to... 50% of those votes. You want to capture, for the lack of a better word, the Muslim vote. Is, 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 is that your focus? Is that your core look, constituency uh, in Muslims? Look, the point is that uh, that's our con core constituency. But what has been happening is we're now getting more non-Muslim uh, members. We're getting uh, more uh, that are paid up members that pay their 50 rand a year. You must join our party, it's only 50 rand a year. And your listeners must pay their 50 rand a year, and join our party, and can download the application form. They will be card carrying members of the party. So we've done the number crunching, and uh, uh, we, are, we, we want to govern the Western Cape, so we want to remove the DA. We may do it in this election. We're working very hard around the clock to do it. But 2029 is the big year. I mean, sure. And we are working on two and a half million votes. But at the same time, what helps us, it will be swelled by the many people who are Christians. Our executive mayor is a Christian. His wife is a Muslim, but he's a Christian. But you know, the wife controls everything, so we, <laughs> we got him cornered. And um, so a lot of, uh, like we have an alliance with the Health Workers Union. They, uh, we have an alliance with Imatu, trade unions. They will all attend our manifesto launch on Saturday in Indonesia. I hope you're going to be there, 11 o'clock. We're going to produce a manifesto par excellence, different to all political parties. I will, I will ensure that our colleagues and, uh, will change and, someone. And, and Al-Jamaa's focus is we defend the Muslim community. We, we got the packet. Guys who qualified for parole, we got them the parole after delay by the intelligence forces. We got the Tulsi twins to get their day in court. And because they served six years detention without trial, I remember the judge saying, I'm not going to postpone this hearing. Otherwise, that member in parliament will say we're dragging our feet again. I, I know that Hendricks guy he mentioned. And then he apologized, Honorable Hendricks, he said that afterwards. We then took on City Press, that Muslim editor, when she tried to finger a Muslim girl in Kenwin as being an ISIS uh, uh, person. Uh, we fingered the, we took the, uh, the uh, SABC TV uh, with the Kenya bombings, where they tried to suggest that if you wear a fish, then you are a Muslim terrorist. And uh, so they had to retrain, the SAPC had to retrain, give sensitivity training. So al is in the forefront of, of defending Muslim interests. I've given you a couple of examples, there are more. But at the same time, we put double the effort in to service our non-Muslim members. But mostly in agriculture, in fishing, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, they come, we assist them in 90 villages in the Eastern Cape Limpopo and in, uh, 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 in KZN. So, uh, the party, while we're aiming for the Muslim vote, we feel we are best placed to capture the Muslim vote. At the moment, we don't have the Muslim vote. The DA has it. They put funding to get it. They funded at least a hundred ulama in the Western Cape and in all other provinces, a bit less. So that is a billion rand fund they have to capture the Muslim ulama. And they hope that that investment will help them now with the Gaza phenomena. People are saying Muslims won't vote for the DA because they stand with Israel, but they still got to vote DA. So we have a challenge to turn that around. And I've got three weeks to go but we, we, we need your listeners to fund our campaign because we can only, only if we have funding can we get the seats to make sure that there is not a white government in South Africa that will stop uh, our cases, South Africa's cases at the Hague. We are at the end of the show, Uncle Ghanif. It's been a pleasure and honor talking to you and my hair is actually standing. Uh, the camera is yours. 
What would you like to tell the listeners, the viewers? The last minute is yours. Whatever it is you would like to tell them, the camera is yours. I want to tell the Muslim voters to cast their vote for Al Jabbar. We are a, a, a Muslim political party, but a platform for all communities. What we do at the moment is taking Dawa to a next level. And we want to thank all the NGOs in the Muslim community for giving Islam such a positive image. Because when they see Al Jamaa, they're not impressed with Al Jamaa, they're impressed with the Muslim community. The Muslim community must be realized they've made a major impact on South Africans for their generosity, for uh, assisting good causes. And so when they see here's a Muslim party coming, uh, they've done the groundwork for us to be accepted by the chiefs. Every chief welcomes anything that is Muslim. They can trust us. Political parties are trusting us. So all we're asking is, trust us with your vote. We have used your vote. Although just with a few lawmakers, we've made amazing strides. We run the city of Joburg. We've given the uh, city of Joburg a first-class mayor. We got a first-class audit. We want, our Niat is a first-class city. I haven't even spoken about the work we're doing with a smart city. But inshallah, we, we need your funding, even if it's 100 rand. Go to our website, Al Jamaa website, donate to the party, become members, and come to the voting stations. Trust us with your vote, like so many other political parties are trusting us. That was Uncle Hanif Hendricks, Buddha Hanif Hendricks, Honorable Hanif Hendricks, President, Founder, and Funder of Al Jamaa Party. It was an honor having him and being in conversation with him. Jazakallah khairan. Shukran. Thank you very much. Barakallah feek. Good. In Conversation With is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry, Crown Mines, and shot on location at Kurtuba Convention Center.